Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here by your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll open our hearts and our minds to listen to your word. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart are truly acceptable in your sight. And help us to remember that they are in actual fact an offering that we give up to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Look, what the... Oh, hello. Uh, we, there were a number of people last time that said they would like me to take smaller, um, smaller chunks instead of trying to do it chapter by chapter. So this evening we're just going to do Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. And if you remember, the first four chapters of Romans is where Paul announces the gospel is a message about righteousness. And you'll all remember this, the righteousness of God being given to people because of Jesus Christ. But we have a problem. And as you remember in Romans chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, it says, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So everyone deserves to die because we fall short of the glory of God. And unfortunately, the world does not see it that way. The world truly believes that they are good that they measure up to their own internal standard. The scripture, however, teaches something different. But there is a solution, if you remember, it's in Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, and it says this, All have fallen short of the glory of God, but we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, to be received by faith. So that's the problem and that's the solution. How do we accept that? If you remember last time we talked about the example of Abraham and how Abraham was declared righteous by God on the basis of his faith. And if you remember also, he is declared righteous by his faith even before the law is given to Israel. Remember in 4.23 it says this, but the words, it was counted to him, that's Abraham, were not written just for his sake, but also for ours. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So that you remember, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, not by law or works. But before we move on to Romans chapter 5, which actually could have the title Peace with God through Faith, we need to ask ourselves the question, why, why do we need peace with God? Is that something that you've thought about beforehand? Why do we need peace with God? Why do we need to be at peace with him? Because everything's going honky-dory down here, can't you tell? Have you ever asked the question, why is God angry with mankind? Not in, not in theological terms, but just in plain speaking terms. Why is God angry with people? If you think about it, societies, people around the world have just walked away from the wholehearted devotion that was characterised by Adam and Eve before the fall. We've just walked away from it. Our hearts, our minds, our souls, our desires, our goals are supposed to be focused on God. But nowadays, if you think about it, even us, people who love the Lord so often, our, even our words and our intentions are shallow. As much as we want them to be deep, they're not. There are those of us, even within the church, who chase after other gods. Oh, no, I don't do that. Of course I don't. But we idolise our careers. We idolise the goals that we're trying to reach. We idolise our own lives. We care for them so much that they become a god. We idolise romance or we idolise popularity in the workplace. 
And as I know, there's one person in the room today who wasn't so popular today. But we want that, and it crushes us when it doesn't happen. We've abandoned God's way in our personal lives, and in our communities, and in our government. Do you remember Zephaniah? Because it's not just happening today. It happened in Old Testament times as well. If you read Zephaniah 3, 3 and 4, it says this, talking about the government. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Then it talks about the church. Her prophets are fickle, tre treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. That sounds a lot like today. And you ask yourself the question, why is God angry with us? And then we get back to theology because it's a human sin problem, the reason that God is angry with us. And it's everywhere. And even though people say, no, no, I'm good. You walk into any kitchen in the back of a restaurant. You go to any stock camp fire if you're from the bush. You go to any work site. You will very quickly experience the backbiting, the slander, and the, just the out-and-out -out godlessness of those particular places. And the worst part of it is, is it's even in church organisations sometimes. Just walk around the neighbourhood here, up at the top end of Diamond Tina Street. See the broken families. Stuart Prison is just over there, all the dads and mums in jail. Have a look around. The 14, 15, 12, 13-year-olds that are on birth control. When they go home, it's chaos. You don't have to walk into a government building in Africa to see corruption. Because it happens here too. Turn on the news. Watch it for a while. Actually, don't watch the news. Look at some of the programs on the news. And you'll start to understand. See, God made the world good. And yet... We're the high point of creation in some sense. We were invited to partner with him. See, we don't take that into account. We were invited to partner with him in the governing and the organising of the world. And we rejected that to go our own way. He gave us the joy of knowing him, of being obedient to him, being devoted to him. Yet, as was written in a book I read Last week, he says, we've trashed the garden, we've crashed the party, used and abused the world and walked away. We are the problem. And it isn't hard to figure that out. Who is responsible for the wars and the crises of our time? Who is responsible for the corrupt governments of the world? Who is responsible for the slums of Mumbai or the trash dumps of Guatemala City? Who is responsible for divorce, disrespectful children, pregnant teenagers? Who do we blame for the cold-hearted and greedy men and women in countries, in companies, sorry, around the globe? It's them. But who will you blame for the anger that you hold or the sexual sin that you hold on to, the gossip that you do, the fighting with your spouses or your brothers and sisters or others in the community, who will you blame for the hypocrisy in your life? See, the thing is, one thing we don't do is what, says in, what it says in Zephaniah 2, 3. Seek the Lord, all you who humble, all you humble of the land who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. Even in our witness and in our preaching, we tend to concentrate and preach on the love of God because it's so positive. So the message of Christianity has become a message of joy and peace and of mercy and of grace. All amazing and absolutely true. We know that. But it's only half of the picture. We actually shy away from the idea of the wrath of God because it really is uncomfortable. Real. Paul just spent four chapters, in a sense, talking about the wrath of God. We shy away from it because we're uncomfortable. 
When we witness, we witness peace, love, joy, mercy, etc., etc., but we fail to witness about the wrath of God. We fail to comment about the sinfulness of men and women. Even when we preach and teach, and I know that's probably not true here, but when we preach and teach, we shy away from the wrath of God because we don't want to make our friends not love us anymore. And as we neglect or run away from the proper understanding of the wrath of God, believe it or not, you then have no appreciation for the joy of God. You don't totally understand the peace of God. You don't understand the mercy of God if you don't understand the wrath of God. You don't understand the amazingness of the grace of God if you don't have it in its proper perspective. So as we look back at Romans chapter 1 to 4, Paul began right there with that. Verse 18, chapter 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. In every encounter between God and men and women, there is, and I'm going to say something perhaps controversial to you, there is no appreciation of the gospel until we realize that we face the condemnation of God because the wrath of God is against our sin, against us, against sinners. When we see that God is a God of justice, when we see that God is a God of holiness, when we see that God is a God of righteousness, when we see that our God must judge sin, then, and only then, will we understand the love of God. And believe me, the love of God and the wrath of God are not contrary, not contradictory. And I'll say that again. In fact, it's not until you understand the wrath of God that you can truly appreciate the love of God. It's only when you see, when I see how much God hates sin that we can begin to comprehend how much He loves us. He loves us so much that He was willing to send His Son even though He hates sin. And it's only when we appreciate, we don't think of this often, the, the personal cost of God sending his son. It's only when we correctly dread the wrath of God, it's only when we correctly fear his holiness, it's only then that we can start to sound how deep God's love is. And it's only at that point that we can start to understand what it is to have peace with God. If you don't understand the wrath of God, you don't need peace. It's just another thing. But if you understand the wrath of God, then you will want peace with God. We get to Romans chapter 5, verse 1 now. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We throw this word around. We've been justified. This is a, a legal word. This is in the court of heaven we've been justified. Now, this is a legal definition, this next quote. A sufficient or acceptable excuse or explanation made in court for an act that is otherwise unlawful or the showing of an adequate reason in court why a defendant committed the offence for which he or she, she is accused that would serve to relieve the defendant of liability. And in this particular case, it's... Because God himself, who is the judge, declared us not guilty. Because he put all of the blame on Jesus. It doesn't mean we're holy. Don't for a minute think it means we're holy. It is simply a legal declaration that the person is not guilty by God in his court. And the thing is, if we're declared holy, we are then treated 
as we are holy. That doesn't mean that we're suddenly perfect, but our standing before God is that of one who is holy. And see, the result is then that we no longer live under the fear of judgment, and we no longer live under the fear of the wrath of God because we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Now, peace in this context is the, the ceasing and the absence of conflict. It is not about a feeling. It's in that war sense when two warring states declare peace. We now have peace with God in a legal sense. We mightn't feel it all the time. Sometimes we may not feel it at all. But the truth is, it's what's called an objective reality. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. You don't have to feel it, but you have to know it. And that brings us to Romans chapter 2. Some of the things that we've accomplished or have been given to us by grace. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. When it says the grace in which we stand, it refers to an absolutely secure position. It means we're standing on bedrock. That's our eternal position before God. From an enemy of God to a child of God, that's the result of our justification. And we can stand on that. And it's guaranteed. There's a corollary in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 that says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which, re which you received, in which you stand. That's how we are to live. We can take it to the bank, so to speak. And that same verse, it says, the hope, of the hope of the glory of God. And that refers to the promise that one day Christians will be glorified and perfected. Something that we hope in that will bring us joy. And I would like to make a slight aside. I think that we have to remember, though, that in some senses... James says true religion is such and such. But we have to remember that our Christianity is to be our lifestyle. It's to be the way that we live. It's to be in our families. It's supposed to be so in us. And it's not just an existential thing that we're waiting for the end of time or the end of our lives. And that's proper and that's good. But it also has to be exhibited here. That's out of Romans chapter 5, verse 2. But it's something that we can never forget. But it's actually the way that we're supposed to be living every single day. But when Paul uses hope in this context, we have to understand what it truly means. Because often it's like, I hope I'm going to get a bike for my birthday. You don't know if you're going to get a bike or not. But that's not what Paul means here. What Paul means is that we're looking forward with an expectation of it because we know that it's going to happen. We just can't see it yet. It's like if you had a dad who said, son, I'm going to get you a bike for your birthday. And your dad has never let you down so far, ever. And so that you know, and you get more and more excited as you come to your birthday because you know he's going to give you a bike. So we can hope in the glory of God in the future. But it's a, it's a sure hope. And then Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4 are so countercultural to what we read and what we hear on the television from a lot of tele-preachers. He goes, not only that, so not only hope, but we rejoice in our sufferings. And he tells us why, because knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. And character, once again, produces hope. So Paul doesn't go with the modern spiel. I'm sure he would never be invited to any churches if he was alive today. Because he'd be too tough, too real. He wouldn't fit in with the affluent or the rich. 
He actually mirrors some words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11. He's, how often do we hear this preached about? Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Notice the word falsely there. Falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. To think about it, to love and serve our master means that we not only rejoice in the future hope or the future glory, but we rejoice in the present trials and the sufferings. You know, it's not because trials, I'm not a masochist, I don't want trials. They're not pleasant. But if you look back to the trials in your life, it's a step by step character building exercise. It's not only a character building exercise, it, it helps the relationship that you have with God grow. Because you see his faithfulness, you feel his forgiveness. You know his presence. You feel his love. You're transformed. And again, not only Paul and Jesus himself, and there's James in James chapter 1. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. We just think of trials as terrible things that happen to us. But they're actually testing your faith. Will you rely on our Lord in everything? And steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, I think we have to understand, James is not talking about some future hope there. He's talking about the present. When you have a relationship with God the Father, when you can stand on that firm foundation, you actually have everything that you'll ever need. We have to understand that rejoicing is actually a choice. It's a choice we make when we declare that even in our hardest circumstances, God is good. And in those circumstances, God is actually calling us to come closer. Our God is telling us to trust him more deeply. And I, I'm going to say, I don't think Paul means that we're supposed to be happy and necessarily enthusiastic about bad circumstances. I think we're allowed to feel hardly done by from time to time. But we have to know. We have to grab hold of the fact that suffering is actually worthwhile. Moving on. And that hope that we have in the eternal will not or does not put us to shame. It doesn't put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You get the connection between the love of God and trials and testing. Trials and testing meaning that we hope more in it and that we're not going to be put to shame. That the Holy Spirit is living within us. He means that our hope will be vindicated. That means our hope will be proven to be true. We won't be disappointed. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have no reason to be humiliated now. But you will have no reason to be humiliated on Judgment Day. Because you belong to Him. It's not just because God is able to do what He promised. It's not just because God is good. It's because he loves us. It's because he cares about us. And it's because he always keeps his promises to us that he's poured his Holy Spirit upon us. Do you remember Joel 2.28 as it's written in Acts chapter 2 verse 17? And in the last days, and we talked about the last days beforehand, meaning it's not like 
Jesus may not be coming back tomorrow. But in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And it's actually a sign of God's love. In this day and age, often in the church, we associate the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues, etc., etc., etc. But the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is actually, in one sense, the seal that we have so that we know that God loves us. Paul is saying God's love has been poured out in our hearts by his Holy Spirit. So each of us carries God's love inside us. That should help us know how deeply he cares and how much he loves us. And that's despite of Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Remember, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. Moving on. How do we know this is all true? How do we know that God loves us so much? And this is how. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us, and that while we were still estranged from him, while he was still angry with us, while the wrath of God was being held back from being poured onto us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is Paul showing the evidence of God's love for us. Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the sinner. And if you look at that word, what, still weak, it's translated a couple of different ways. It's translated as weak. It's translated as powerless. It's translated as helpless. It implies someone who's feeble, who's sick, and yet God still died for us. So what we're supposed to get from this is that there is nothing that we have done that has earned this salvation in any way. We're supposed to be so grateful to God because it's entirely by the grace of God. And at exactly the same time, it's just the right moment. And there's two ways I think we can think about the right moment. It's the right moment in our lives. God waits till the right moment to talk to us, to teach us, to draw us, to bring us back to life. When we've finally lost enough of our self-will, when we've finally got over ourselves enough, God waits for the right moment. But what he also, and is more correct, is that he waited to the right moment in history. Just the right moment. And it's all based on God's grace. Grace is the, the theme of the gospel everywhere for, Chris, for, for, for Paul. Grace, God reaching down when he didn't have to do it. And at the same time as you look back over these couple of verses, you can see that the Father... The Son and the Holy Spirit are all in there. They're all connected. All part by grace. Paul shows that God proved his love for us by his acting first. And then you think about it, don't you? This is an aside. You think about why people, how could God possibly allow so much evil in the world? God doesn't allow evil in the world, in one sense. We muck it up so much all the time. It's his grace that stops him acting. Can you think about this for a second? Can you just imagine God ringing planet Earth, ringing ahead, saying, oh look, I'm coming on a godly, kingly visit shortly. Can you get everything ready for me? No, we don't want you. Or he could have waited until we were slightly better morally or slightly, you know, people that deserved it. I think it's my mother's telephone telling her that um, her reading is about to 
that she's supposed to do a reading. But he didn't. He didn't ring ahead. He didn't wait till we got better. He loved us and he took action while we were still helpless. The thing is, he did it while it was impossible for us to save ourselves. And Paul says or shows that God revealed his power to us. This is something that we don't think about so often. By sending Christ to die at exactly the right time. And we have to remember too that the, um, the arrival of Jesus in history, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, were all at the perfect moment. God's plan, not our plan. Perfect timing. All motivated for his, by his love for us. Verse 9 says, Since therefore we have been justified now by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Have you ever asked yourself what um, by his blood or the blood of Christ actually means? Because we say it so often. Do we know what it actually means? Sorry? Well, in some ways it does literally mean that, that he bled on the cross. But it actually means so much more. Encapsulated in that, the blood of Jesus, we have the idea of Christ's blood has the power to atone for an infinite number of people who have committed an infinite number of sins. But there's also the understanding that it means his death. And the full atoning work of Jesus Christ. It's not just his blood shed. There's all of this in the idea. But don't, don't just categorize it as Jesus' blood shed. When they're talking about it, it means the whole of what was done in his death and resurrection. Still, it was by grace. Two Corinthians chapter five verses fifteen says, "And he died for us, that those who live might no longer live for themselves." So when you're talking about thinking about the blood of Jesus, and he died for us, for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who, for their sake, died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard, regard, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Do you see the leap? His blood means his death. His death means that we are now a new creation. His blood, his death, death we're freed from sin. We're free to serve the living God. We're free to glorify him and enjoy him forever. And as probably Protestants, we concentrate on the death of Jesus so much that sometimes we forget Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we have been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. We concentrate on the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus, but we forget sometimes the life of Jesus, the living of Jesus. And what you don't understand, or what I didn't understand, maybe you guys did, is that Paul has totally changed the image. For the last nine verses, he's been talking about legal justification. Now, he changes it to reconciliation. He's gone from the language of the court to the language of the family. And as Brian said, and relationship. Now the death of Jesus means that we're reconciled. But notice again the reference to his resurrection. Salvation is also based on Jesus being alive. So for any Christian that says it's just 
a myth. You know, Jesus lived, but his resurrection, it's just a dream, you know, it's just something that we, we want to hope for. Paul says, no, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we have nothing. So our being saved not only includes justification at the beginning of our Christian journey, also the process of sanctification, our completed sanctification when we reach eternity. Eventually we will be glorified, which means we will have a new body. We'll be free from condemnation, as well as any future reward we get. Is not based on his death. It's based on his life that he lived. And Paul goes even further. He's basically saying to us, it is both the death and the resurrection of Jesus that are necessary for salvation. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 5, 11, more than that, adds to it again. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received re re reconciliation. If you think about it, because of our sin, God is the one that had the dispute with us. And Christ's death and his resurrection satisfied God's demands to make things right. And it's only through God's grace and our faith that the war is ended. So we're reconciled. Notice that's a past tense. It's not a present tense. When you become a believer, the legal transaction is completed. You don't have to worry. Well, you do, you, you do, have, to, you do have to work going forward, yes. Not for your salvation. You can't just stay a milk baby Christian all the time. But in your heart of hearts, the transaction is complete. In your heart of hearts, you can know we have peace with him. God is not out to get you anymore. You have peace with him. We now stand in his grace. We can stand on that absolute firm foundation. It's more than that. We can also know that he's poured his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. And you know what? We didn't do it. God did all of that. There's a promise that those who have trusted in Jesus now have and forever have the reconciliation that we require to be with God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can open up your word. Thank you that we can look at Romans chapter 5. But most of all, Heavenly Father, help us to apply it to our lives so that we live a lifestyle that is in tune with you, about your work, about kingdom business, so that people will look at us and see you and want to have faith and take advantage of the grace that you have shown us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.